In the flat earth model of the cosmos, the North Pole is the immovable center of the world and the entire universe. Polaris, the North Star, sits straight over the North Pole at the highest point in the heavens, and like a slowly rotating planetarium dome, all the celestial bodies revolve around Polaris and over the Earth once per day. The sun circles over and around the circumference of Earth every 24 hours, steadily traveling each day from the equator during the March vernal equinox up to the Tropic of Cancer at the June summer solstice, back down to the equator for the September autumnal equinox, and all the way down to the Tropic of Capricorn on the December winter solstice. In the Flat Earth model, the South Pole does not exist at all, and Antarctica is instead a gigantic ice wall extending the circumference of Earth, holding in the oceans like a giant bowl or a world cup. As strange as this concept may sound at first, it is a fact that if you set a bearing due south from anywhere on Earth, inevitably at or before 78 degrees southern latitude, you will find yourself face to face with an enormous ice wall towering 100 to 200 feet in the air, extending to the east and west the entire circumference of the world. General Greeley in Antarctica or the hypothetical southern continent wrote, the ice barrier, so frequently referred to in accounts of the Antarctic regions, is the forefront of the enormous glacier covering or ice cap, which, accumulating in vast, undulating fields from the heavy snowfall, and ultimately attaining hundreds if not thousands of feet in thickness, creeps from the continent of Antarctica into the polar sea. The ice barrier, yet a part of the parent ice cap, presents itself to the navigator who has boldness enough to approach its fearful front as a solid perpendicular wall of marble-like ice ranging from 1,000 to 2,000 feet in thickness, of which from 100 to 200 feet rises above, and from 800 to 1,800 feet sinks below the level of the sea. Dr. Samuel Robotham wrote, it has been demonstrated that the Earth is a plane, the surface center of which is immediately underneath the star called Polaris, and the extremities of which are bounded by a vast region of ice and water and irregular masses of land. The whole terminates in fog and darkness, where snow and driving hail, piercing sleet and boisterous winds, howling storms, madly mounting waves, and clashing icebergs are almost constant. Antarctica is not the tiny ice continent found confined to the underside antipode of astronomers' globes. Quite the contrary, Antarctica literally surrounds us 360 degrees, encircles every continent, and acts as a barrier holding in the oceans. The most commonly asked questions, and the greatest mysteries yet to be solved, are how far does the Antarctic ice extend outwards? Is there a limit? What lies beyond, or is it just snow and ice forever? Thanks to UN treaties and constant military surveillance, the North Pole and Antarctica remain cloaked in government secrecy, both purported no-fly and no-sail zones, with several reports of civilian pilots and captains being shooed away and escorted back under threats of violence. Dr. Samuel Robotham wrote, How far the ice extends, how it terminates, and what exists beyond it, are questions to which no present human experience can reply. All we at present know is that snow and hail, howling winds, and indescribable storms and hurricanes prevail, and that in every direction human ingress is barred by unsealed escarpments of perpetual ice, extending farther than the eye or telescope can penetrate, and becoming lost in gloom and darkness. Before reaching the Antarctic ice wall, Navigating the increasingly tumultuous southern oceans, explorers encounter the longest, darkest, coldest nights, and the most dangerous seas and storms anywhere on Earth. Vasco da Gama, an early 16th century Portuguese explorer of the South Seas, wrote how the waves rise like mountains in height, ships are heaved up to the clouds, and apparently precipitated by circling whirlpools to the bed of the ocean. The winds are piercing cold, and so boisterous that the pilot's voice can seldom be heard, whilst a dismal and almost continual darkness adds greatly to the danger. In 1773, Captain Cook became the first modern explorer known to have breached the Antarctic Circle and reached the ice barrier. 
During three voyages lasting three years and eight days, Captain Cook and his crew sailed a total of 60,000 miles along the Antarctic coastline, never once finding an inlet or path through or beyond the massive glacial wall. Captain Cook wrote, The ice extended east and west far beyond the reach of our sight, while the southern half of the horizon was illuminated by rays of light, which were reflected from the ice to a considerable height. It was indeed my opinion that this ice extends quite to the pole, or perhaps joins some land to which it has been fixed since creation. On October 5, 1839, another explorer, James Clark Ross, began a series of Antarctic voyages lasting a total of four years and five months. Ross and his crew sailed two heavily armored warships thousands of miles, losing many men from hurricanes and icebergs, looking for an entry point beyond the southern glacial wall. Upon first confronting the massive barrier, Captain Ross wrote of the wall, extending from its eastern extreme point as far as the eye could discern to the eastward, it presented an extraordinary appearance, gradually increasing in height as we got nearer to it, and proving at length to be a perpendicular cliff of ice between 150 feet and 200 feet above the level of the sea, perfectly flat and level at the top, and without any fissures or promontories on its even seaward face, we might, with equal chance of success, try to sail through the cliffs of Dover as penetrate such a mass. William Carpenter wrote, Yes, but we can circumnavigate the south easily enough, is often said by those who don't know. The British ship Challenger recently completed the circuit of the southern region, indirectly to be sure, but she was three years about it and traversed nearly 69,000 miles, a stretch long enough to have taken her six times round on the globular hypothesis. Dr. Samuel Robotham wrote, If we now consider the fact that when we travel by land or sea, and from any part of the known world in a direction towards the north polar star, we shall arrive at one and the same point, we are forced to the conclusion that what has hitherto been called the north polar region is really the center of the earth that from this northern center the land diverges and stretches out, of necessity, towards a circumference, which must now be called the southern region, which is a vast circle, and not a pole or center. In this and other ways, all the great navigators have been frustrated in their efforts, and have been more or less confounded in their attempts to sail round the earth upon or beyond the Antarctic Circle. But if the southern region is a pole or center, like the north, there would be little difficulty in circumnavigating it, for the distance round would be comparatively small. When it is seen that the earth is not a sphere, but a plane, having only one center, the north, and that the south is the vast icy boundary of the world, the difficulties experienced by circumnavigators can be easily understood. If the earth were truly a globe, then every line of latitude south of the equator would have to measure a gradually smaller and smaller circumference the farther south traveled. In other words, the circumference at 10 degrees south latitude would comprise a smaller circle than at the equator, 20 degrees south latitude would comprise a circle smaller than 10, and so on. If, however, the earth is an extended plane, then every line of latitude south of the equator should measure a gradually larger and larger circumference the farther south traveled. 10 degrees south latitude will comprise a larger circle than the equator, 20 degrees south latitude will comprise a circle larger than 10, and so on. Likewise, if the earth were a globe, lines of longitude would bubble out at the equator while converging at the poles, whereas if earth is an extended plane, lines of longitude should simply expand straight outwards from the North Pole. So which is actually the case? David Wardlaw Scott wrote, Upon the principle as taught by scripture and common observation that the world is not a planet but consists of vast masses of land stretched out upon level seas, the north being the center of the system, it is evident that the degrees of longitude will gradually increase in width the whole way from the north center to the icy boundary of the great southern circumference in consequence of the difference between the actual extent of longitudes and that allowed for them by the nautical authorities, which difference, at the latitude of the Cape of Good Hope, has been estimated to amount to a great number of miles, many shipmasters have lost their reckoning, and many vessels have been wrecked. 
ship captains, who have been educated in the globular theory, know not how to account for their getting so much out of their course in southern latitudes, and generally put it down to currents. But this reason is futile, for although currents may exist, they do not usually run in opposite directions, and vessels are frequently wrecked, whether sailing east or west. During Captain James Clark Ross's voyages around the Antarctic circumference, he often wrote in his journal, perplexed, at how they routinely found themselves out of accordance with their charts, stating that they found themselves an average of 12 to 16 miles outside their reckoning every day, some days as much as 29 miles. Lieutenant Charles Wilkes commanded a United States Navy exploration expedition to the Antarctic from August 18, 1838 to June 10, 1842 almost four years spent exploring and surveying the Southern Ocean. In his journals, Lieutenant Wilkes also mentioned being consistently east of his reckoning, sometimes over 20 miles in less than 18 hours. Dr. Samuel Robotham wrote, The commanders of these various expeditions were, of course, with their education and belief in the Earth's rotundity, unable to conceive of any other cause for the differences between log and chronometer results than the existence of currents. But one simple fact is entirely fatal to such an explanation, that when the route taken is east or west, the same results are experienced. The water of the southern region cannot be running in two opposite directions at the same time, and hence, although various local and variable currents have been noticed, they cannot be shown to be the cause of the discrepancies so generally observed in high southern latitudes between time and log results. The conclusion is one of necessity, forced upon us by the sum of the evidence collected that the degrees of longitude in any given southern latitude are larger than the degrees in any latitude nearer to the northern center, thus proving the already more than sufficiently demonstrated fact that the earth is a plane, having a northern center, in relation to which degrees of latitude are concentric, and from which degrees of longitude are diverging lines, continually increasing in their distance from each other as they are prolonged towards the great glacial southern circumference. Reverend Thomas Milner wrote, In the southern hemisphere, navigators to India have often fancied themselves east of the Cape when still west, and have been driven ashore on the African coast, which, according to their reckoning, lay behind them. This misfortune happened to a fine frigate, the Challenger, in 1845. How came Her Majesty's ship Conqueror to be lost? How have so many other noble vessels, perfectly sound, perfectly manned, perfectly navigated, been wrecked in calm weather, not only in dark night or in a fog, but in broad daylight and sunshine, in the former case upon the coasts, in the latter upon sunken rocks, from being out of reckoning, under circumstances which, until now, have baffled every satisfactory explanation. The equatorial circumference of the supposed ball earth is said to be 24,900 statute, or 21,600 nautical miles. A nautical mile is the distance following the supposed curvature of the earth from one minute of latitude to the next. A statute mile is the straight-line distance between the two, not taking into account earth's alleged curvature. The Australian Handbook Almanac Shippers and Importers Directory states that the distance between Sydney and Nelson is 1,400 nautical or 1,633 statute miles, allowing a more than sufficient 83 miles as the distance for rounding Cape Farewell and sailing up Tasman Bay to Nelson leaves 1,550 statute miles as the straight line distance from the meridian of Sydney to the meridian of Nelson. Their given difference in longitude is 22 degrees, 2 minutes, 14 seconds. Therefore, if 22 degrees, 2 minutes, 14 seconds out of 360 is 1,550 miles, the entirety measures 25,182 miles. This is larger than the Earth is said to be at the equator, and 4,262 miles greater than it would be at Sydney's southern latitude on a globe of said proportions. One three hundred and sixtieth part of twenty five thousand one hundred and eighty two gives seventy miles as the distance between each degree of longitude at Sydney's thirty four degree southern latitude. On a globe, twenty five thousand miles in equatorial circumference, however, degrees of longitude at thirty four degrees latitude would be only fifty eight miles, a full twelve miles per degree less than reality. 
This perfectly explains why Ross and other navigators in the Deep South experienced 12 plus mile daily discrepancies between their reckoning and reality. The farther south traveled, the farther the divide. Dr. Samuel Robotham wrote, from near Cape Horn, Chile, to Port Phillip in Melbourne, Australia, the distance is 9,000 miles. These two places are 143 degrees of longitude from each other. Therefore, the whole extent of the Earth's circumference is a mere arithmetical question. If 143 degrees make 9,000 miles, what will be the distance made by the whole 360 degrees into which the surface is divided? The answer is 22,657 miles or 8,357 miles more than the theory of rotundity would permit. It must be borne in mind, however, that the above distances are nautical measure, which, reduced to statute miles, gives the actual distance from the southern region at a given latitude as 26,433 statute miles, or nearly 1,500 miles more than the largest circumference ever assigned to the Earth at the equator. Similar calculations made from the Cape of Good Hope, South Africa, to Melbourne, Australia, at an average latitude of 35.5 degrees south, have given an approximate figure of over 25,000 miles, which is again equal to or greater than the Earth's supposed greatest circumference at the equator. Calculations from Sydney, Australia, to Wellington, New Zealand, at an average of 37.5 degrees south, have given an approximate circumference of 25,500 miles, greater still. According to the Ball Earth theory, the circumference of the Earth at 37.5 degrees southern latitude should be only 19,757 statute miles, almost 6,000 miles less than such practical measurements. Dr. Samuel Robotham wrote, the above calculations are, as already stated, only approximate, but as liberal allowances have been made for irregularities of route, etc., they are sufficiently accurate to prove that the degrees of longitude, as we proceed southwards, do not diminish as they would upon a globe, but expand or increase as they must if the earth is a plane, or, in other words, the farthest point, or greatest latitude south, must have the greatest circumference and degrees of longitude and William Carpenter wrote, Parallels of latitude only, of all imaginary lines on the surface of the earth, are circles, which increase progressively from the northern center to the southern circumference. The mariner's course in the direction of any one of these concentric circles is his longitude, the degrees of which increase to such an extent beyond the equator, going southwards, that hundreds of vessels have been wrecked because of the false idea created by the untruthfulness of the charts and the globular theory together, causing the sailor to be continually getting out of his reckoning. With a map of the earth in its true form, all difficulty is done away with, and ships may be conducted anywhere with perfect safety. This, then, is a very important practical proof that the earth is not a globe. I phoned up Antarctica. There's like a there's like a tourist umbrella you have to go through, and I sort of said, "Oh, I've got loads of money. I've got boats in Hawaii and India, which I don't." And me and some friends were going to hack down to Antarctica and walk across it. And I got loads of emails off these people saying, "No, you don't. No, you don't. Fill out your permits. You've got Orange membership. And I'm fill out this. Why are you coming?" I got like totally hammered just for saying I'm coming to Antarctica. What I found is you're only allowed in through New Zealand, uh, South America at the bottom, and South Africa at the bottom. And they take you in, you see some penguins, you sleep somewhere cold, and they throw you back out, all for like $5,000. Now, it's totally locked down, and I did an article about it where I looked at the Treaty of Antarctica, which is some countries got together and locked it down. They've got a lot of science research going on there, and they just don't let anyone in. Now, where this, also where this treaty meet, they have a big table that's shaped in a pyramid with the top cut off. <laughs> Which is, you know, you can call me a conspiracy theorist, but there's, there's obviously something there. What, what would you like to add on the Antarctica rim model, Eric? Yeah, so Antarctica is not just the tiny ice continent on the bottom of the globe that it, it shows. But it is the case that no matter where you are on Earth, if you go southwards from there, you'll hit Antarctica. So if you imagine expanding that little uh, 
Antarctic continent on the bottom of the globe out to an ice rim all the way across uh, along around the earth rather the north pole being in the center anywhere you go in a straight line you will end up going to the ice wall yeah and many uh, boats through you know since the 40s 50s have talked about my instruments went crazy there were ice walls for hundreds of miles i got lost there's so many of these stories yeah and, and so they say that there's a south pole somewhere too on part of that guided tour that you're talking about they've got, they've got an arbitrary point along the antarctic ice that they've put a red and white barbershop pole with a ball earth on top of it and claim that that's the south pole but they even admit that it's not the real south pole because the real geomagnetic south pole is constantly moving so since it's constantly moving you're never really going to be able to see it but the, the reality is, is they can't have people going down there with a compass and checking to see it, if it really it is, is the south clever. pole last year Prince Harry was down there and he basically just made some filming he was with Rupert and Tarquin and a few of his friends and the story was it was on all the mainstream news Prince Harry in Antarctica oh we had to go back it was just too cold I, my foot got blisters and frostbite. What the message to the subconscious is, it, it doesn't matter how rich you are, don't go there, it's too cold. They know that Prince Harry and a team of injured servicemen and women have been walking to the South Pole. Well, they've got there, they've completed the 200-mile Walking with the Wounded South Pole Challenge, that's its proper name. Uh, they've spent more than three weeks trekking through Antarctica, and this was what it sounded like at the moment when they arrived at the bottom of the world. <laughs> Oh, it sounds quite restrained, doesn't it, after all that effort? Well, they spent 20 hours in a cold chamber. This was the prince and the other competitors who were with him uh, to prepare for the conditions that they were going to find down there. The expedition was supposed to be a race. You might remember it being billed that way before it started, but the weather became so bad as they went along that they scrapped the competitive side of things and just joined up as one big team instead. And this was how Harry reacted after completing the mission. Um, we're here, we made it. It's Friday the 13th. Um, we've had so many things go against us. We've had beautiful weather, but bad weather before, and bad terrain and injuries and stuff like that, but... Um, everyone's made it, all 12 of them, the whole group of 20, whatever it is, but the 12 wounded soldiers have made it. Um, couldn't have made it without everyone's help, especially back home, you know, the founders, uh, Ed and, 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 and Simon as well. But um, everyone, is, everyone is so happy. Everyone's touched the ball, we've all had photos, we've all had hugs, few tears here and there, but um, all in all, um, mission success. Basically. If you're wondering about that ball that he was talking about, it's the, the ceremonial South Pole at the Amundsen Scott South Pole Station. It's, a, it's like a metal sphere on a red and white pole, and it's partly surrounded by the flags of the signatories of the Antarctic Treaty. So it's lovely for a photo, but the problem with it is it's not, it's not the real South Pole. It's about... 300 meters away so at the so real you, south pole what is that? Is it well there's nothing that's the thing it's you can't see so to do it properly to cover all your bases you have to do both you have to do the picture with the ball and then you have to go and kind of hang around at the exact um why don't they move longitude the ball to and where latitude. the actual thing is well that's a very sensible like, question it's not one i can answer <laughs> okay. but it's a very good